Okay, so William asks, do you see more of a niche sector fund? And how do you see this compared to agnostic ones? So most of the funds have a sector and a geography. And often it's three sectors, three topics. Uh, and the geography is most often local. That topic could be, in the case of Founders Co-op, that topic is tech. And in the case of Flying Fish, it's tech and, and something. Software. Else. No, it's just software. It's just software. All right. Uh, in the case of some other funds, it's just women. And they don't care where the women are or what the women are doing, but it has to be a company run by women. E8 calls themselves a clean tech angel group. Clean tech being a very broad definition, but they'll only invest in things that, that fall into their definition of clean tech. The agnostic funds are the ones that are hardest to raise money for. And so Seattle Angel Conference, that's blind. They put the money in because they don't know what the companies are. In Fledge, they know they're going to be impactful companies, but they don't know where in the world they're going to be or what they do. But we promise that it's impactful. So that's one filter. But beyond that, we don't do subsectors. And again, when I go out and talk to investors, and I've at this point talked to at least a thousand investors, many of them will not invest in an agnostic fund. They will simply say, no, that's not what I care about. What I care about is either we can go to, what I care about is high growth 10x returns or 100x returns. Or the other end is what I care about is sanitation and water. And I don't want to invest in anything else. And there's funds out there that only invest in fish and funds out there that only invest in fintech or ag tech or food or only in three countries in this part of the world and so forth. And there's, they're usually pretty picky because investors are usually pretty picky. So the Oregon uh, Angel Fund and the Seattle Angel Fund, now Sea Change Fund, are sector agnostic. And they don't have necessarily problems raising funds, but they have a very specific active angel thesis. And so it's the process that draws people in. I think 50-50 uh, split you're seeing of, I want to be active and I want to make all my own decisions, or I don't want to be active, but I want you to do the right thing are a different group than the group that ends up in the C, C yeah. change fund. And it could be that the, um, that in terms of the conference, that they're really coming in because they want the learning. Uh, that's for sure. And the so they're coming in and they want the learning on how to be an angel investor. And then once they figured out what they like, you know, and again, John talked about the split between go big or go home and I like to make money. Like I like to earn revenues, right? That's a big split. And then they might find a subsector underneath that, which is I just like tech or I just like impact or I just like food. All, all they, nine of the angel groups in Seattle have alumni from us so they you know have moved to where they like but i would argue that nine is not enough for seattle we have several segments that ought to be getting more money like our med tech is way underfunded and so i think we would have more angel groups to start that thing off a little bit faster yeah and for some reason angel groups kind of cluster around 40 to 60 people so you know ideally in seattle i keep arguing about the fact we have too many angel groups. If we had 20 more, that would actually be a good thing, right, in the end, if they could learn how to work together, which, which they're working on.